It is the quintessential view of downtown Seattle. It's what you see in all the postcards. And fortunately for this client, he can wake up to that every morning. New Year's Eve, it's a zoo. New Year's Eve, it is packed. Everyone assembles, and from 10 o'clock on, it just goes crazy. If you come to Seattle, travel from anywhere, and want to take a picture of the city, you take it from Cary Park, you, you shoot that view. If uh, Monday Night Football comes to Seattle, they run a truck here, and they have a camera crew, and live from Seattle, they run the view. That's, that's it. You know, you have fog that rolls in and out again. You have the cloud formations behind the city and above it. Um, even on a stormy day, it's, it's still gorgeous. I mean, clearly you don't buy this lot and pay the price for this lot without understanding that it's, you know, about the view. And uh, what's the phrase in, in real estate? Location, location, location. What we have here is something that's dynamic. It's, you know, it's the pulse of the city. You can feel it when you look at the view. People will, will come to Cary Park and they look at the space near. From now on, I can guarantee with these windows are open, they're gonna be turning around and going, look at the inside of that house. When someone enters this house, and if you look at the front door, the size of the front door, I mean, it's, it's masculine, it's monolithic. Uh, obviously, it's built to be framed on the Space Needle, and it's wonderful, but when, when a guest comes, especially a female guest comes, and puts her hand on the front door, you're naturally leaning over and you're looking through this window, and what are you catching? You're catching the mural. When you walk through the front door, <clears throat> you encounter the Juarez Machado, which is in what we affectionately call the Love Shack. Uh, it was an area that we felt one could uh, slip in and sit with someone, maybe have a glass of champagne or just a quiet chat during a party. The mural that's in that room needed to be, it needed to be remarkable, powerful, and romantic. If you look at this artist, and this is a wonderful, wonderful piece, this is shot from the original painting and cropped and blown up to be scaled for this little room. We had a shear wall there that we couldn't move. And so it created a cubby, if you will, or a small space. Uh, the client didn't want a bar or a wine bar or anything related to that. And so it was obvious that it was going to be a nice, special little nook where you could have a private conversation. Um, that, you know, that led us to calling it the Love Shack. We had a couple people at the party uh, that we threw. We had sort of a soft opening, and uh, my friends Gary and Yumi sat in that love shack and uh, recreated the pose. It was fabulous. Everyone wants to go in and get their picture taken there. As an architect, we love these clients that at some point fall in love with their homes, and then they just wear them the rest of their lives, and they nourish them. And, and I think Bob, and especially Mike, have really keyed into a garment that will nourish Ken's life. Early on in the, in the conversation uh, with the homeowner, I noticed that he was always wearing a, a wristwatch of some sort, always a different wristwatch, and he was fascinated by them. So I started to sketch wristwatches, big dials and bands. And the owner, Ken, said, gee, I, I like that, what is that? And, and we said, well, they're, they're wristwatches. We wanna hide the mechanical heating and cooling systems. We need ways to do that. Wasn't it a great feeling? You come in through that door and you have this element above you at, that's leading you straight to this large disc in the ceiling. It's whimsical, it's beautiful, it's done with a fit and finish that is just uh, spectacular. The other thing with this house is, uh, remember we use Pumi heating systems, which are zoned heating. They're not quite ductless, but you, you have a lot of mechanical that is not buried up in the ceiling as it would be in a typical home. You can cool one area and heat another, uh, and 
in its highest form, this system will share resources. If you have a warm room and you have another room that is cool, you can take the heat out of the warm room and bring it into the cool room. When you sit and look at a, at a structure from the outside and from within, if you just sit and look at it carefully, it's going to tell you what you can do with it. Mike has a, just a fabulous aesthetic. His knowledge of the periods and what, what materials, what shapes, what styles span those periods is just uh, phenomenal. The house is very curvilinear. It's very deco in, in its structure. So he says, gosh, I love deco. Could we do deco? And he gravitated toward the art deco, which coincidentally, Mike and I just embrace. I and mean, that's our favorite style. And I said, well, you know, Ken, the reality is that most great houses were not necessarily built in the deco period. They were built earlier, Ampere period, and even older. The houses were remodeled really into deco houses. When Art Deco came in, it came in in 1925 in Paris. And it was just one of those streamlined things. I mean, it, you, it's reminiscent of cruise ships, of, uh, of trains. The plan was that we would bring him a very period fireplace, very ornate, and then we would move through the house with that deco influence. And so it has massive columns. It actually has wood columns on plaster columns. Um, those columns support a tablature at the ceiling, so it gives it purpose to have a column. And a beautiful antique mirror between those comes down and lands on a, the beautiful uh, Rosa Levanto stone mantle, and that turns into the rainforest marble that surrounds the firebox. Uh, periodically, uh, Ken and I would go uh, to San Francisco or New York, uh, make some trips to shop for uh, vintage pieces, obviously deco pieces if we could find them. We found this remarkable iron table uh, at the deco collection. This was from San Francisco. These are vintage Chapman lamps, uh, remarkably sexy, timeless pieces. And uh, of course, the piece de resistance here is uh, uh, the Paul de Soma nude. Uh, Paul is a disciple of, uh, started with Dale Chihuly, uh, and I, I think the, maybe one of the finest uh, blowers of figures in the world. You know, you bring in this rug, you find these just tasty little tete-a-tete uh, -tete chairs, rework the woodwork on those, buy these fabulous hides out of Bolivia, and upholster these little chairs, just tasty. And then you add a squid ink sofa to that, you know, just upholstered beautifully with the, just the right, the right size. It fits the client perfectly. I mean, this is what Mike does. This is what he knows. about another era. It's about the 30s and the 40s, and it's about living a lifestyle that was tasteful, where civility and manners meant something, where entertaining in a grand style meant something for your friends, and where the artwork meant something. Every piece had a reason to be there, a raison d'etre. You walk in to the foyer of this house, and, and you spin to the right, you see the dining room, and you look up, and without question, what captures your, your attention is the Mark Stock. And the butler is in love with the woman of the house. And the butler is essentially invisible. He doesn't exist. They may have conversations past him, they dine, but they never understand who he is. So the question becomes, as you sit at this dining table and you contemplate the painting, is it better to have tasted love and never had it, or to never taste it at all? <laughs> To have it be juxtaposed to the Juarez Machado and then to turn to the left and look at the uh, opposing uh, piece 
of the two lovers at lunch. This guy is seducing his lover, and she wants it to last as long as it can. She's ordered dessert, she hasn't touched it. She's ordered coffee, she hasn't touched it. She's got a fresh cigarette lit, there's no ashtray even on the table. She wants this experience to last as long as possible. Now, this gentleman, like any man, wants to get where he's gonna get. <laughs> and there's no question where he's gonna get. She's not trying to remove his hand, she's not pushing it away. It's about experiencing this love and this lust and this wonderment. If you had a guest come to this home, if Ken had someone walk in the house, undoubtedly the first thing you're going to notice uh, because of the size and the power of these pieces is the art, uh, the ambiance, the coloration of the whole house, the lighting is soft. Um, it's essential house. So when you experience all the art in this house, you experience it from entering the house, you see this little nook, you see the celebration of dining and life and love, you see the agony of the butler in love, and then you see the culmination, it brings you full circle. And no matter how many times you come into this room, you'll contemplate these paintings and you'll make a story for yourself. It begins with a babinga slab for the countertop. That rests on a die wall that's covered in a representation of shagreen, which in the period was manta ray skin. Today we don't kill any manta rays, as Mike would point out. We use a vinyl substitute for that. It's beautiful material. So, so we have this globe that you can move in any direction, uh, and you don't have these axes around it, you know, it's completely free. The globe allows you to talk about anything, you know, it's, it's new, the person's here the first time. How easy is it to just say, oh, I've been here, or have you ever traveled there? So then around that, the really deco element is this uh, metal machined, beautiful nickel plated material that comes in into this beautiful sinuous shape and expresses itself as what we call it, the necktie. The t necktie that runs down the front uh, comes uh, through the, the piece of uh, Babinga slab. The ability to render it, the ability to sit and talk about it with the team and have Bob render those ideas rather than sketch and sketch and sketch and redraw. The next day when you've got a completed render and you're able to show it to the client and the client sees exactly what you're trying to accomplish, you actually have a a, a historical record of these things, render by render. So with the globe and the necktie and collar, um, it, it was a collaboration between a metal fabricator and a machinist, uh, and the uh, Chris Loop and the uh, wood fabricators who had to build the bowl for it as well. We have the, the circular top, we have the nickel plated uh, collar and necktie and we have the globe which is partially uh, set into the top. All of those things had to work within an eighth of an inch and the globe moves on three sets of bearings uh, that are set in the bowl. It allows you to move the globe in any, posi any direction, any position. Uh, you know the key to any successful design process whether it's interior design or architecture or anything else is to have people that can execute on that design. We brought in uh, Chris Loop to do the, the kitchen cabinets. Um, Chris is a second generation woodworker. Um, I worked with his father in the 70s, Jonathan Loop, who was an absolute icon and a tremendously talented guy. He collaborated with Wally Catlin. Uh, both of those guys I've worked with on multiple projects before, superior craftsmen. Uh, and the, the product that you've seen uh, in the house is a testament to what they can do. When he first saw that kitchen, in fact, the kitchen was supposed to be extended out, and we decided to shorten it, bring it back into that area in the back. And he stood there and he said, this is where I want to be. I want to see the Space Needle and I want to 
you know, flip burgers or steaks right here. And so that dictated and said to me, okay, we have to look for this certain type of appliance, we have to look for certain types of cabinetry that will support that. If you stood in the room and you had no handles on anything, you would be hard pressed to know that that was a refrigerator and freezer sitting in that row of cabinets. It's that good. Once we told Chris what we wanted, he you know, started the jungle drums beating found uh, bacon veneers in Canada, and they had some massive flitches, uh, 10, 12 feet high, 50 inches wide. It created an opportunity to do something that was unique, something that was deco, uh, something that you just haven't seen before. So the idea of this, this master bath was obviously some serenity. Electronically, you can fill with laminar flows from the ceiling. These laminar flows spin the water in a circular fashion, and they come down. They're placed to hit the curve in the tub so there's no splashing. So you have three sources for water. It fills it automatically to temperature control. And you can sit and watch a movie, of course, on the screen, or just light a candle. Maybe look in the reflection of the window and look at this mid-century uh, painting by Wade Zint. This is a, a, a nude that uh, was acquired uh, through the family and uh, looks beautiful on the vintage uh, deco vinyl that we have in the background. The cabinets look like they're black. In reality, when the sunlight hits them, they're Bing cherry. And you can see the grain and the depth of the cabinetry. Ken wanted a bathroom reminiscent of being aboard uh, a luxury liner. And the bathroom uh, needed to evoke that period. He came in one day and he had a picture of this Devon and Devon sink and he said, I absolutely love this sink. Is there a way we can use this? And we, we said, sure, it's an extremely period. So we started to play with drawing a surround that actually matched the sink and that's how the bathroom happened. You see all the polished nickel ribs at the bottom and that carries through uh, over the camphor burl and you see the interiors. Vanna. Yeah, Vanna White here will show you the uh, inside of this cabinet. We were chosen because of our marine expertise and with marine work there's a lot of very intricate curved work and that's really our specialty when it comes to cabinetry. All of these uh, cabinets in the bathroom were built by a, a company called Durante Furniture in Vancouver, Canada. Well, when we were approached, uh, vintage was a word that was used. So when we talked about it, we felt that it was important that we use materials that would accept stains beautifully, uh, that wood matching would be very critical, um, that we would be able to use burls that would be a nice complement to the panel work. I asked them to match a Bing cherry. I said, I want the stain so dark that when you walk in the room, you think it's black and white. You think it matches the diamonds in the floors. But when the sunlight hits the cabinetry, it turns to Bing cherry and you see the grain. Incredibly masculine, very beautiful sensual color. A tree grows how it's gonna grow. Branches of, are where they are. And you have to learn to work around the defects. And so yes, it is a very artistic process. So let's go into the office. Yeah, he does work from, from a home office uh, as well as in, in other places, but it is a functional part of his day. The, the desk is, uh, is a mahogany desk, a, a vintage piece we found in, in San Francisco. The wood in his office, we chose uh, a crotch mahogany uh, in, a, in a rich brown. You have to be careful with crotch mahogany, but when you have the application where you can use it, I mean, it just is, it's, it's stunning. It's just powerful. Uh, Bob tortured me into redesigning this office three or four times every time I'd come to work in the morning to have another drawing. What about this? <laughs> Let's curve that. The copper uh, background in the wall covering, it's hard to see, but as you move, you'll see the glint of it. Uh, Heidi found all of these vintage fabrics for the, for the draperies and the shears. 
First of all, you have to think of a fabric not only as what it's going to look like, what it's going to feel, how it's going to reflect. A lot of uh, deco fabrics in the draperies on both floors, wonderful uh, shears around the bed in a men's shirting uh, fabric. You, you, you see the shears to it, yet it's very masculine in the men's shirting. We have an oversized uh, uh, California King, and the overhang in this bed is really made to conceal the heating and air conditioning. The ducts are inside, so there's a curtain of air that falls down at the foot of the bed. So the concept for the canopy was to humanize the size of the room. And who doesn't love a bed canopy? you know, to start off with. It gives you that opportunity for the corner drapes. You know, it just, it, it makes it such an elegant space. The canopy gave us the opportunity to still celebrate that tall space, but at the bed to bring it down to a human scale. It does have that, uh, that view window uh, into the shower and from the shower out to the Space Needle and of course across the water. The, the head wall to the bed is, is on the angle that faces directly at the Space Needle and the whole of downtown Seattle. Well, we do have a little view and if you're not tired of seeing it by now, there's the Space Needle again. It's pretty remarkable and this is pretty much king of the world. You wake up here every morning and say to yourself, I better get up, I gotta pay for this. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's really kind of an art novella. It's a story, it's an architecture of stories. And as we go along in life, what a greater way to live than to have a house that tells a story and has, has a biography. It's a, and a novella, it's an art novella that, that, um, that we've kind of created here. Collectively, they've just done an incredible job of pulling on the oars through a lot of uh, choppy water and getting it done. And I, I just can't, you know, I can't say enough about them as people and professionals.